welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, I'm Zach Hancock. I'm an evolutionary biologist who specializes in population genetics, phylogenetics, and genome evolution. And this is the fifth episode of the Causes of Evolution series, my ongoing series where we look at the quantitative aspects of evolutionary theory, and we really try to derive all of the mechanisms, all the evolutionary forces from sort of first principles in mathematics. Um, for regular viewers, um, you'll know that it's been um, a little over a month since I last uh, published a video, which is a little bit of a long lull for my part. I've been really, really busy in the lab lately. We've got two papers we just submitted um, on top of me going through a lot of the genome sequences that we finally got back. Um, for those of you that might be familiar with my Amphipod sequencing project that I've been sort of documenting on this channel a little bit. Um, we finally got the genome sequences back for that, and I've been kind of combing through them and doing some quality control, stuff like that. So I've been just really, really busy in real life. Um, so, but I'm, you know, I'm really excited to be back talking about this topic. Genetic drift is one of my favorite mechanisms of evolution, and it's also one of the most misunderstood mechanisms of evolution. So really excited to kind of get into the nuts and bolts of how it works. Um, and we, we always start these, this, uh, these episodes off in this way, talking about the assumptions of Hardy Weinberg. You've seen this many times if you've watched the previous episodes. Um, again, we, we bring this up because all of the mechanisms of evolution are derived from violations of these assumptions. So the previous ones are the gametes are paired at random. We know when they're not paired at random, we call this non-random mating. This is a pretty weak evolutionary force, if you recall. It doesn't generally lead to sustained change on its own, but it can change allele frequencies. Uh, and it, it can change genotype frequencies as well. So um, it is an important force of evolution, but it's a pretty weak force on its own. Um, the second is that gametes aren't preferentially chosen from the gene pool. And when they are preferentially chosen, that's natural selection, right? It's selection is peeking into the bean bag and picking the best ones. Um, we went through and derived all the mathematics behind at least one locus models for natural selection. Um, we then discarded the third one, allele frequencies are equal between the sexes. Violations of this is actually actually not a mechanism of evolution because a single generation of random mating actually puts you back into Hardy-Weinberg. Um, the most recent one that we did was looking at alleles, um, the violation of the assumption that alleles don't change from the individual to the gene pool, that's mutation, right? That there's not some new variant that emerges um, and is introduced into the gene pool. Um, we talked a lot about um, sort of like the, the biochemistry behind mutations, the mechanisms behind mutations, um, and then a little bit of sort of the pop gen theory there. Today, we are looking at the fifth violation, um, and that is that gametes are drawn infinitely and with replacement. And when they are not drawn infinitely and with replacement, that means we are actually looking at a finite sampling scheme. And that is what we call genetic drift. So let's start off pretty simply and let's just like take a broad view on what the effects of finite sampling are. Now, I'm going to talk about this in terms of like populations and alleles and stuff, but really this applies to any kind of statistical sampling in which you have a finite number of possible samples to take, right? Where you don't have an infinite sample choice. Um, so this is so this is true in many, many systems, not merely in population genetics. So let's start off with um, a population of size 10, right? So there's 10 balls here, five are blue and five are red. Now, let's imagine that each one of these individuals produces an, some number of gametes and we take those gametes and we put them into a bag, right? Um, and all of the, the distribution of gametes within the bag should reflect the number, the proportion of reds and blues that we had in the preceding generation, right? So there's 50% of all the you know, beans in the bag, balls in the bag are blue, 50% are red. I'm referring to the beans in the bag here, and I've included the little Haldane uh, cartoon um, to kind of draw an allusion to uh, a paper that he wrote in 64 called uh, Defense of Beanbag Genetics. Uh, if, you've, if you've never read it, I highly recommend you go check it out. Um, it's, a, it's a satirical and really funny paper um, that sort of of uh, fighting back against all, some other biologists, namely Ernst Mayer, who were critiquing population genetics by calling it beanbag genetics. Um, and so check it out. It's a really funny paper. But uh, this is sort of a simplistic way to, to think about this process is that each one of the par parents gives some number of gametes into the bag and the proportion of gametes in that bag reflects 
the preceding, um, the distribution of the preceding generation. Okay, so now what we want to do is we're going to pick 10 gametes out of that bag, and the 10 that we pick are going to populate the next generation, okay? And we're going to pick them at random, and since we only pick 10, right, and we're not drawing infinitely from that bag, that means that by chance alone, what we pick might deviate from the proportion in the preceding generation. So to make sure that I did this like as randomly as possible, I created an object in the programming language R that I just called X, and I set that equal to um, uh, C just means like, include everything within this. So this is five zeros. You can think of these as blue and then five ones, which are red. And then we use the function sample. We sample the object 10 times with replacement. This is really important. So what replacement here means, it's a statistical term saying that, let's say we drew a blue, right? By drawing that blue, we could technically have changed the distribution now of blues in the bag. Right. So if we just take that blue out, set it aside, now we've changed that distribution. But sampling with replacement means that we take the blue, we mark down, we got a blue and then we put it back. Right. So we're keeping the distribution in the bag exactly the same. What that means in a biological sense, like what that assumption would mean is that each one of the parents can produce effectively infinite gametes. Right, that if we choose one of the gametes that they produced, that doesn't dramatically change the distribution of gametes, right? So we still have the same number of blues, still have the same number of reds in the bag um, because they produce so many gametes. This is generally a fine assumption because organisms do produce lots of gametes, right? So that's why early population geneticists were perfectly fine with that assumption because organisms do produce lots of gametes. Um, where that starts to become problematic is if you have things like gametic selection, right? You have some other sorts of biases that are impacting how many gametes an individual might produce. But in this case, this assumption works perfectly fine. So that's that's why we're talking about sampling with replacement. It's important to sort of bear that in mind. Um, okay, so we're, we draw them from the bag. And what I ended up getting is in the next generation, we have 40% blue and 60% red. Just, just by chance, we have now changed the distribution of blue and red by 10%. And then we do it again. So now all I've done is I've taken the new distribution of reds and blues, the 40 and 60%, and then I make, I remake the X object as four blues and six reds, and then I sample from that bag, right? When I do that, now suddenly in the next generation, we have 30% 30, 30 blues and 70% reds, right? So again, that just by chance, just by chance sampling, we are changing the distribution of how many gametes are going to be given into that bag. So this is, again, a very simplistic way of thinking about the effects of finite sampling. Now, one of the useful ways of thinking about genetic drift is in replicates. So if we had, if we did this exact same thing many, many times for a bunch of replicate populations. So in this case, we've got five different bags. So five different populations where we're starting off with 50% blue and 50% red, and then we're walking every single generation and saying, okay, how does it change? So what I've done here is I basically did that same process I just walked you through, but I did it five times in replicate, and I did it until either blue or red are the last things left in the population, right? So starting here, after one generation of sampling, we go from blue to 40%, red to 60%. Do it again, red is 70%, blue is 30 the next generation, it stays exactly the same. The, I drew the same distribution. And then after one, two, after four generations, red is now fixed in this population. Okay, so for this replicate, red becomes the only allele left. And this one, you can see it took a lot more generation. So there's a lot more fluctuation, but eventually blue fixed in this one. Red in this one, red in this one. And then this one had the most number of samples that I had to walk through before eventually blue became the one that was fixed. So in our five replicates, we see three out of the five times red fixed, two out of the five times blue fixed. Um, that's as close to half and half as you can get in this in this uh, setup, right? Um, so again, that's just a, a random fixation of which ones are going to end up being the last allele in the population. And that's just a very simplistic way of thinking about 
the effects of finite sampling. Um, this is a plot of 10 different replicates, all starting off with allele frequencies of 50%, um, going out to 50 generations, after which you can see all of them have been fixed. And you can see it's super noisy, right? So they're just, these uh, alleles are just bouncing around. Some of them fix really rapidly. Some of them are lost really rapidly. Some of them bounce around for a long time before they go to fixation or loss. So this is the same thing that I was showing you previously, but just showing it for lots of replicates across you know, up to 50 generations, right? Okay, so the stochastic change in allele frequency every single generation is genetic drift. That's what we mean by genetic drift. And we've, we've now kind of looked at it very simplistically, just sort of like, you know, we're just drawing beans from a bag, but we can actually evaluate this probabilistically. And, I, and that's generally the way in which we approach genetic drift is because since we, it's not deterministic like mutation or selection, we have to kind of approach this in a probabilistic manner. And since the way that we've been approaching it is as in a biallelic state, so we've got reds and blues, for example, um, you can also think P and Q, right, as the frequencies of red and blue. Um, since there's only two choices, we can actually model this using the binomial distribution, the binomial being two, right? Um, this is the same sort of distribution you would use to model a coin toss, right, because you can get heads or tails. Uh, it's binary, zeros and ones, right? That's the binomial distribution. And this is the way it's set up. So. We say the probability of having I number of alleles of B uh, is equal to 2N choose I. That's the way to read that, um, where uh, 2N is the total population size. And then I is, again, just the number of B alleles that you're asking what the probability of it will be, um, multiplied by P, which is the frequency of the blue alleles in the preceding generation, raised to the number that you expect to choose, multiplied by Q, which is the frequency of the red in the preceding generation, raised to 2n minus i. So since there's since it's biallelic, if you chose i number of blue alleles, then you must have chosen 2n minus i red alleles. Let's put some numbers into this just to, to kind of make it a little bit clearer. So let's say we wanted to know what's the probability that I had five alleles of B in the next generation. Now, remember, we started off with five and five. So that's basically asking what's the probability I stayed exactly the same. Um, so that is equal to 10 factorial because the population size is 10 divided by five factorial times five factorial. It's five and five because, we're, again, we're asking what's the probability of getting five. So that's the I here. And since we're getting five of the B and the population size is 10, then we must have also chosen five of the red, right? And what these factorials indicate is to perform the following operation. So for like five factorial is equal to one times two times three times four times five. Um, and what this represents is how many distinct possible states could we have chosen? So we're assuming that if we chose five, that's an independent event of whether or not we could have chosen one, or we could have chosen two or three or four, right? So we need to we need to multiply all of those possible choices together to be able to get the probability that we chose exactly five instead of any other number up to five. So that's what this first part represents. And then the P's and the Q's here are 0.5 because that's the starting and then raised to the number of choices, right? Um, and then plugging in our numbers, we get uh, the probability of choosing five alleles of B is equal to 0.246, uh, roughly 25%. So uh, to sum up, that basically means that we have, if we you know, start off with five alleles of B, what's the probability we have five in the next generation? It's 25%. And we can do this for any number of alleles going from loss all the way to fixation. So we could ask, what's the probability that I have 10 alleles of B? Right. That is to say that B goes from five to 10 in the next generation. So from 50 percent to fixed, that's that we just plug in those numbers here and we see it's a very low probability that you started with five and then jumped all the way to 10. Same thing for if you have, you know, only two alleles of B, right? We can plug in any number from zero to two N and ask what that probability is. Um, and then we can plot that probability distribution like so. So on the X axis here is the number of B alleles that we're going to choose in the next generation. Again, it's conditional on how many we started with is, is how this probability is calculated. But on the Y axis is then that probability, right? So you can see though with the highest probability, we stay at exactly five. We stay at what we started with. Um, and then that, that distribution starts to fall off as we get closer and closer to either loss or fixation. It's actually symmetrical. It's the same probability in either direction, right? Um, so highest probability, we stay exactly the same, but it's only 25%, right? So there's still a very good chance and, and you know, 75% chance that you're going to change in allele frequency, right? Despite the fact that staying the same 
itself has the highest, there is a greater distribution outside of that. And so more than likely, you're going to, to change an allele frequency by chance alone. Um, another thing that's important here is how tight this distribution is, is completely dictated by the size of the population, right? So how big this 2N is, is going to dictate how broad this distribution is. So if you make 2N really, really large, this distribution gets really, really narrow, right? So, and in fact, if 2N goes to infinity, then the distribution is exactly centered on five and it will never change and you would be in Hardy Weinberg, right? Um, and so like the the further and further you get from infinity, the broader that distribution is gonna become, right? Just, so just bear that in mind as you're thinking about genetic drift and um, the probability of changing that, that allele is a function of how many samples you're taking every generation. Okay, so now we've talked about the very simple, what are the effects of finite sampling in a sort of beanbag way, and we've introduced the binomial distribution. Now we're ready to talk about the very first model in population genetics for looking at finite sampling, and that is looking at genetic drift in modeling it in a population genetic framework, and that's the Wright Fisher model. Um, so the bearded man here is R.A. Fisher, and then the man next to him is Sewell Wright, and the two of them together um, were the first to use this uh, sort of binomial distribution in a matrix algebra approach, which we'll talk about in a second, to actually model how gene frequency should change through time using just from just finite sampling or just genetic drift. Um, it's the simplest model of genetic drift. It basically has all of the assumptions of Hardy Weinberg, except for the finite sampling part. Uh, and we'll make that explicit. So you can imagine um, in diploid parents that produce an infinite number of gametes, right? So there's, we're sampling with replacement, um, and then they pair at random, right? So we have completely random mating. Um, individuals are assumed to be hermaphroditic. And what this means is that they actually have a probability that they can self. Right, and that probability is equal to one on n right, and so you can think about it as if they're mating at random, then they're just picking some individual in the population at random to mate with and. By chance or one on n, they could pick themselves right um, so that's sort of implicit within the model here. Um, you should recognize this expression as just the binomial distribution right this that's all that this is. Um, and this X sub I J represents a transition matrix between states J and I, right? Um, and so the X I J is the probability of being in state I at time T plus one, given that you were in state J at time T. Now I know that, that that's maybe some difficult jargon, but I'll explain exactly what that means in just a moment. Um, but this very simple expression, which is effectively just the binomial distribution viewed through a transition matrix um, is the Wright Fisher model, right? And let's walk through how exactly it works. So let's start off um, by calculating the probability matrix itself. So up here at the top is the uh, number of alleles of B, we'll say we'll stick with the blue alleles, um, which will be equal to J. So that's the J in our transition matrix. So you can either have zero where there's no alleles, um, or you can have four where it's fixed. And we're setting 2n equal to 4 here just to make it simple because as you get to bigger and bigger and bigger population sizes this transition matrix gets enormous right and so i'm just trying to limit it such that it can fit on a slide and we can do them we can completely do the math um in in a much easier way so 2n is equal to 4 uh instead of 10 we're 10 my gosh it would take us forever to do 10 so 2n is equal to 4 and at generation t so the present generation how many of the b alleles do you have and that's equal to j Okay, so that's on the rows, and then the column here is at generation T plus one, so in the next generation, the number of B alleles you have is equal to I, okay? So let's see how you would read this. So let's say we started at generation T with zero alleles of B. In the next generation, what's the probability we have zero alleles of B, right? And so if we started with zero, what's the probability of one, two, three, four, and then if we started with one, what's the probability we have zero, one, two, three, four, right? So that's the way you kind of read this matrix. Um, importantly, if we start with zero alleles, right? And there's no mutation, like, right? Where there's no other processes happening. If we start with zero alleles and the probability in the next generation we have zero alleles is exactly equal to one, right? Because there's no mutations bringing that allele back. And so if it has been lost, then with probability one, it will stay lost. 
Um, alternatively, if it has been fixed where everybody has it over here at four, then the probability is one that in the next generation, everyone will still have it. And we call these two states in the transition matrix absorbing states, because effectively everything between there is some number less than one. Because that allele is just you know going to be fluctuating around, but then once it falls into one of these absorbing states, either fixed or lost, then the system basically ceases. Right, you are, you are now fixed or you've lost that allele, and you're finished iterating at that point. So that we call these the absorbing states. Everything else in between, we fill in with the probability. So let's say we started off with one allele, and we want to know what's the probability in the next generation that we have none. So that's effectively that that allele has been lost. Well, that's a 30% chance. All that we've done here is we've just plugging in these numbers into this expression. Right? That's where all of these numbers are coming from. They're coming just straight from this expression here, where again, 2n is equal to 4, the i is equal to how many we're going to have here, and then the j is equal to how many we started from up here. Right? Very simple, we're just plugging in the numbers. So we can fill in the rest of this matrix with, um, with depending on what we started with in j and what we're going to end up with in i. Okay, so that's our probability matrix. You know, real simple, we can get that, those calculations, um, but that doesn't really tell us how we could iterate in like a population model, right? So like what the Wright Fisher model really wants to do is iterate over many generations. How do we expect allele frequencies to shift? We want to be able to predict that, right? So that's an, an akin to asking what's the probability of having exactly I alleles of B after T generations, right? So let's start off by assuming we begin with two B alleles where 2n is equal to 4. So, it, so the B alleles starting off are at 50% frequency. This is the new matrix that we basically are going to want to build here. The columns are going to be generations, and then the rows are going to be the number of B alleles. So starting at generation 0, we have exactly two alleles, right? Um, so generation zero with exactly one probability, because that's what we st we're starting with. We know what that is. And so with zero probability, we have any other number because, again, we're, we're stating we're starting with two. Um, and so what we want to know is, OK, in the next generation at, at time one, how many alleles do we expect to have? Um, one of the things that this matrix is going to have to follow um, just to, to kind of make this explicit is that for every single one of these columns, um, the sum of those columns must be equal to one because it is a probability. Um, and so we basically just write that like so. So from J equals zero, where the, you know, it's lost up here to two N, which is four down here. Um, we sum across Y and we're calling this new matrix we're creating. We're gonna call it Y. We sum across the matrix Y sub J of T um, for every value in the column, uh, the summation of which must be equal to one. So at zero, we know obviously it's going to be equal to one, but at every single one of these changes, it's always going to end up being equal to one. Um, okay, so how are, we, how are we going to calculate this? What do we need to do? Well, we need to bring back our, our other matrix, right? Um, and then we're going to do a little bit of matrix algebra here to um, enable us to be able to calculate every single one of these generations across uh, effectively an infinite number of generations, right? So I put the little equation up here. This is y1, where this is the column uh, for y1, is equal to x, where x is this matrix, multiplied by y0, with that, where y0 is this column. Okay, um, And we're going to do a little bit of matrix algebra to be able to calculate the change in the frequency every generation. Okay, so I've color coded these to kind of help us keep up with things. So the blue is always going to be what we're multiplying from the Y matrix. The red is going to be what we're multiplying from the X matrix. And effectively, again, the, the product of these two is what's going to be the entries in each of the new columns that we're, yeah, in each of the new column that we're filling out for the, uh, the Y matrix, okay? So this is how we do it. We want to fill out that very first entry. And so what this first entry represents is the probability that we have no more of the blue alleles, okay? So we need to then multiply all the possible ways that we could end up with no blue alleles. Well, we could end up with no blue alleles because we started with no blue alleles up here. And so that would be one multiplied by zero because we know we didn't start with no blue alleles, but just, for, just to keep up with everything. So that's written down here. So one multiplied by zero is the probability we started with none and then we have none in the next generation, plus the probability that we started with one and then have none in the next generation. Again, that's 0.316 that we started with one and have none in the next generation, 
since we know we had two and not one, that's also multiplied by zero, right? Then we have the probability that we started with two and went to zero, which is 0 0.063. So that's the probability we started with two and went to zero multiplied by how many we started with, right? Well, in this case, we did start with that many. And so then we have 0 0.063 multiplied by one, right? And you can see the rest of the entries are also zero because the rest of these entries are zero. And so the probability that we started with two and went to zero, right, is 0 0.063. And then we basically just do the same thing for each and every entry. So for uh, this one here, this is again, the probability we started with zero and then went to one is zero, right? And the same thing is here. So that's just zero times zero, um, plus the probability we started with one and went to one or stayed at one. Again, it's gonna be multiplied by zero because we didn't start with one, right? So this first column is really easy to fill out because we know we started with two and not these other ones, okay? So let's just go ahead, fill that one out that one's really simple to calculate because again, we already knew what the preceding values were. And so most of the multiplication was just zero. Now that we've gotten that generation in though, the next generation's calculations are a little bit more complicated because now notice we are no longer looking at this column to calculate for generation two, we are actually now gonna use this column, okay? So for to calculate y2, so this is this column, is equal to, once again, x multiplied by the column y1, which is what we just calculated. So now, what's the probability that we have zero alleles? Well, that depends on how many we started with. If we started with zero, what's the probability we have zero? Well, that's equal to one. So we multiply one times the probability we started with zero, which is this value here, plus the probability we started with one and went to zero, which is this, multiplied by this, which is the probability we started with one, right? And we do that all the way across for each one of these values, and we end up with the probability of having zero alleles in generation two as 0.166, okay? Then we do the same thing with the probability of having one allele, right? And we just follow it through once again, right? And then we do that all the way through the rest of the matrix. We can fill that matrix out to infinity, right? Um, there's a couple of interesting things uh, should emerge from this pattern. So notice first that we started off with two, right? So that probability is obviously one. And the first generation, that probability stays high at 0.375, and where the other probabilities around it are lower. So you can remember that sort of bell curve where you had highest that you stayed the same, and then it begins to fall off. But then watch what happens. As we iterate through more and more and more generations, that probability starts to flatten, right? So it goes from 0.375 to 0.246 to 0.181 to 0.136, right? So it's getting, so the middle part is getting lower and lower and lower. And then watch where that rest of that probability is being added to. It's being added to the extreme values. Right, so they're starting at the lowest, but then by the time we're only four generations in, they are now the higher probabilities, right? So you have a higher probability by generation four that you have either lost or fixed that allele. So what that distribution is looking like is it starts off like this, and then it flattens, and then the ends start to rise, right? Um, and then if you go all the way out to infinity, what you will find is that with a 50% probability, you have lost it. 50% probability you have fixed it, and all the other ones in between are basically zero. That is that, that it is still polymorphic is effectively zero. So this really drives home the central point of genetic drift. The genetic drift leads to the loss or fixation of an allele, and that the probability of fixation is equal to its initial frequency in the population. So notice this, we started off with two, Right, and since the population size is, is four, that's a 50% frequency. And so the probability, notice that it goes to fixation is exactly 50%. That also means that the probability of loss is one minus the starting frequency. Now, since we started with 50%, the probability of loss is exactly equal to the probability of fixation. But if we were looking at say a brand new mutation in the population, right? Brand new mutation start out at frequency one on two in because there's only one of them out of all possible individuals. So the probability of fixation of a brand new mutation then under just genetic drift alone is one on two N.
right? And that's what we've shown here using this sort of matrix algebra approach. You've probably heard this many times that the probability of fixation is one on two n. I know I've said it on this channel a bunch of times, um, but this is where that math actually comes from. Um, furthermore, that tells us that the probability of loss of a brand new mutation is one minus one on two n. Um, hence, most of the time, brand new mutations are lost to chance. And the probability that they are lost to chance obviously increases as the size of the population increases. Um, and, the, and the probability that a mutation goes to fixation by chance increases as the size of the population decreases. Right. So that kind of tells us something about why population size is such an important feature of genetic drift and why it's dictating the rates at which alleles can rise and fall in frequency just due to chance alone, because this chance alone is a stochastic sampling effect. Okay, so let's add another column here. This is something else that's really interesting and worth digging into is that the average frequency of an allele is expected to stay exactly the same across generations. This might seem counterintuitive, but if you can imagine this as again as a replicate population, so a bunch of bags instead of just a single population. And we consider each one of these columns, again, as the probabilities, which would be shared across multiple populations, then uh, P bar, so the average frequency at time T, is equal to the initial frequency that we started iterating across every possible generation, right? So, to, so for example, let's say we wanted to know what the average frequency should be at generation one. Right. So we would get that by saying, OK, the probability we have zero alleles multiplied by the number of alleles we have, then the probability we have, you know, uh, one allele multiplied by how many we have. And then we just do that across the whole column. That's the summation across the whole column. And then we divide that by the number of possible alleles two in or in, and in this case, four. We can see that that's equal to two over four, which is equal to 50 percent. Right. We could do that for every single column all the way to infinity. And what we would find is that the average frequency in each one of these iterations is exactly 50%. It doesn't, it doesn't change across generations. Um, and this is true irrespective of when they start going to fixation. So let's say you have 100 populations, right? Half of them are going to fix the allele by chance. The other half are going to lose the allele by chance. So the average of those two is still 50% since 50 fixed it and 50 lost it, right? Um, so that's another kind of interesting feature of genetic drift. Um, furthermore, the variance in this uh, average is based on the binomial distribution variance. Um, so the variance in the change in P across generations is equal to P1 minus P divided by 2N, where 2N is the, the total sample size. Um, this is a really important equation uh, when it comes to like calculating the effective population size, which we'll touch on a little bit uh, towards the end of this. Um, the next column I want to add is heterozygosity. Um, and this is a really, really important feature of genetic drift as well, that since genetic drift always leads to fixation or loss, that means that every single generation, what genetic drift is doing is it's reducing diversity, right? It's, it's removing variation from the population. Um, and the rate at which it does this is a function of the population size. So if we're calculating heterozygosity here, um, you should actually kind of recognize this form. If you think back to Hardy Weinberg, um, this is just two times P times Q. Right? That's what these two terms are. It's, it's, it's two PQ where we're just summing over all the possible ones from loss to fixation and then across each column. When you plug in the numbers here, you can see we start off um, at generation zero at heterozygosity 50%, it's just equal to the uh, that initial frequency. And then as we walk generation by generation, you can see the heterozygosity goes from 0 0.5, 0 0.375, 0 0.281, all the way. And then by the time you get to the infinite time point, heterozygosity is zero, right? Because you've either lost or you fixed that allele, there's no more diversity in the population. So genetic drift always reduces heterozygosity. Um, another thing that we can ask is how long uh, should we expect to wait until an allele becomes fixed in a population? There's two different approaches to this problem. One is very um, cumbersome and people don't generally do this, but it, it is an exact measure. So you could do it this way. And it's, again, using this sort of matrix algebra approach. If we ask, okay, so this is the time to fixation of P is equal to one over P 
the summation from or multiplied to the summation of t equals one so starting off at time point one all the way to infinity um and then t multiplied by what is the present column summation uh, this is y sub 2nt minus the previous generations one so you can see it's kind of an iterative uh it's it's an iterative formula starting at time point one going all the way to infinity um that's obviously a very cumbersome way to calculate this because that just basically means you have to calculate the entire matrix right. Um, people don't generally want to do that, uh, and so what we actually use whenever we're doing this calculation um, is we often rely on what's called the diffusion approximation. The diffusion approximation which I haven't talked about in this series yet, but we will once we start kind of putting together a couple of processes. Um, is actually borrowed from physics. Um, so it's a, it's actually about gas molecules diffusing in a vacuum. And so you can actually apply this to population genetics. Uh, Kimura was one of the first to do this actually. Um, and the way you can do it is you imagine like you've got gas particles moving around in a vacuum and their, their movements are random, right? Which can kind of mimic genetic drift. So imagine if you just flattened that plane, you started all the particles at, at one side and that's, you know, the initial frequency starting them at one side, and then you let them walk across that plane until they get to the end where the end is fixation. So their movements are random, and they just kind of bounce around right just like a, a particle would diffuse through a vacuum right and we're just conditioning on that diffusion being one directional. So with those kind of modifications to the diffusion approximation, we can actually use it to calculate lots of interesting things about, you know, stochastic processes and population genetics. Um, and this is one of those interesting findings. So we can see that the, the, the time to fixation of P is actually equal to this little expression here. And what's really cool about this is that when P is very small, such as like when there is a brand new mutation in a population, um, then this actually simplifies to approximately 4n, right? So this is another thing you've probably seen many times, uh, both myself and others have, have said that the average time to fixation is 4n generations. This is where that comes from. It comes from the diffusion approximation and assuming that the starting frequency of P is very small, such as in the case when it's a brand new mutation. Um, so we can actually plot this shown here. Um, this is again just keeping the formula here. So this is the average time to fixation. Um, and down here is the frequency of P. And then on the y axis is the age of the allele, right? So how long, how long has that allele been segregating in the population before it goes to fixation? And you can see for a population of size 1000 um, that the average time to fixation is 4n generations. I've just marked that here by this dashed line. Um, because of this, this allows us to actually calculate the age of any neutral alleles that are segregating in a population um, because it has this sort of expected um, rate of increase in frequency, we can we can get a pretty good estimate of how long it's been segregating based on what its frequency is in the population. And again, assuming that it's that it's an, a neutral mutation. One of the things that's really cool about this is that if you look at the change in the frequency across generations, it's nonlinear, right? So it's not like it's a linear increase. It's actually most of the change in the frequency or most of the time to fixation are actually uh, concentrated when that allele is at low frequency. So over here, you can see that, you know, halfway to fix or halfway of the time to fixation would be 2000 generations. And you can see that that is only maybe 25, 30% frequency. So half of the time of that allele's life is spent at low frequency. It takes a really long time for it to start increasing in frequency. But then once it starts, you can get an almost linear fit by the time you're at about 50% frequency, right? Um, so again, because of this, we can calculate how long that allele has been around based on its frequency. So for example, let's say, um, let's use a human population as an example, and let's say there's some allele that's at 80% frequency, right? So it's really, really high frequency. If the population size is 10,000, uh, using this expression, then that allele first emerged 35,000 generations ago. Um, for an, a human uh, generation time, that's approximately 892,000 years. Um, so for any alleles that are at really, really high frequency in the human population, they are probably very old. Now, they're very old specifically if they're neutral right if they if they're if they've risen to that high frequency completely by chance alone then we know that they're very old 
right? So we do have to distinguish between alleles that are at high frequency because selection is driving them versus alleles that are at high frequency because drift is driving them. And there are really cool ways we can tell the difference between those two things, which we'll get into in future videos. Um, I also just wanted to juxtapose uh, this with what is called the site frequency spectrum. So over here on the right, um, the X axis is the allele frequency starting at, you know, basically one, which is, you know, only one individual in the population has it all the way to 50%. Um, this is what's called the folded site frequency spectrum. So we're not showing, you know, all the way to fixation. We generally uh, truncate this distribution at 50% because it's very hard to distinguish uh, whether it's ancestral or a derived allele. So we usually just break it into 50%. And this sort of distribution to me really helps demonstrate the process of genetic drift, right? That most alleles in populations that are brand new are at, you know, very, very low frequency. And most of the time they never increase in frequency, right? So you can see most alleles that you would find segregating in the population are down here at very low frequencies. And then as you get to higher and higher and higher frequencies, that number just exponentially falls off to where most alleles have already been lost, right? So very, very few mutations that ever emerge in a population will ever reach high frequency. Um, so I just wanted to kind of show that this is like a, the neutral expectation of the allele frequency spectrum is, is this shape where most alleles emerge and are lost by chance. Okay, so all of this is maybe seems very abstract. There's lots of model assumptions. Um, you might be thinking, how often can any of this actually be used to model real populations, right? Like, like this is a very, seems very abstract and mathematical. Um, but it turns out it actually works incredibly well on real populations. And this is a famous study from Bury in 1956. It is a laboratory population, but the fits um, to this binomial distribution are incredibly well. Um, so what Bury did is he examined genetic drift in laboratory populations of Drosophila melanogaster, which is a, a the, you know, fruit fly. And he was looking at populations that were heterozygous for the BW allele. So starting over here, this is the gene frequency distributions um, at generation one for all of his replicate populations. So he had a bunch of different populations, and this is the distribution of that frequency um, at the beginning of the experiment. And then what he did, he just kept the population sizes, the, you know, roughly the same. And then across subsequent generations, he just measured, okay, how many, what's the allele frequency in the next generation? And then you just plotted that all the way to generation 19. Notice what's happening. So he starts off with this sort of binomial distribution. It's very like, you know, bell curve distribution. And then at each subsequent generation, it starts to flatten, right? You can see as he's walking through all of these generations, it flattens and then it starts to spread towards the edges. So by the time you get generation 19, you have lots of populations that are you know, fixed now for these, for these alleles, um, which is exactly what we predicted using just the simple Wright Fisher population model that is just based on the binomial distribution, right? So this is pretty incredible that you, that you see the exact shape that we expected to see. Furthermore, he estimated heterozygosity as it changed through subsequent generations in the experiment. Um, the little dots here are the measured, what he actually empirically measured in terms of heterozygosity. And then the dark line is the fit from the formula that I showed you previously for calculating heterozygosity. Look at how remarkable that fit is. Right. And again, that formula for calculating heterozygosity is assuming this binomial distribution. It's assuming all of the all of the assumptions that we made previously. And despite that, the fit is very, very good. Um, one of the, this is one of the key reasons that I like to always try to bring back this empirical application is that people often like to say, well, it's, you know, this is beanbag genetics, right? Like there's there's so many assumptions. This can't possibly reflect anything in reality. But all of these models are actually exceptionally robust to these assumptions. Um, and it's very important that we understand that. Uh, and so that's why I wanted to show you this, this, you know, sort of classic genetic drift experiment that actually ex almost exactly replicates sort of what we were looking at um, in, in the you know, simple math leading up to this point. Okay, so the next really important thing to understand is the relationship between the concepts of genetic drift and inbreeding. Um, Inbreeding in this context um, simply means that individuals are identical by descent, 
okay, that they that they share a common ancestor. Um, this is not inbreeding in the sense that relatives are choosing to mate with each other. It just simply means that you are identical by descent. So if I have a certain allele and you have that exact same allele, and that's because we share a, an ancestor that had that allele at some point in the some point in the past, then we are inbred with respect to that allele. Okay, that's that's what inbreeding means in a population genetic framework. And we can measure this using F statistics. So I introduced the F statistics in the non-random mating uh, video previously. Um, and it's basically just a measure of the probability that any two individuals are identical by descent. And to, to kind of make this clear, so imagine the simple population where again, you have red and blue alleles. Um, and let's assume that if you are blue, then you are identical by descent at some point in the past. And if you are red, then you are not, okay? So for these two individuals, since they have this common ancestor, they are identical by descent, right? They come from this single ancestor in the preceding generation. The probability of that is one on two n, right? That's the probability that each of these chose this ancestor out of the two n possible ancestors they could have chosen. Right. So that's the probability that they are IBD. Um, again, this tells us something really important, and that is that the probability of being identical by descent scales with the size of the population. Smaller populations are more inbred. This is, this is what we mean when we talk about inbred populations, that the smaller and smaller they are, the more likely that they are composed of close relatives. Right? And close by close, we mean how many generations back that you share an ancestor with some individual, right? So these individuals are identical by descent. Now notice these two individuals, right? They are both blue. So they are identical by descent, but not in the preceding generation. So we call this identical by state, right? And so if you're identical by state, we're assuming that you were identical by descent in some preceding generation. So we have to go back a little bit further before the two of you have a common ancestor, okay? Um, or you can be not identical by descent. So if you are like the red and the blue here, then you are not identical by descent. And that occurs with a probability of one minus one on two M. So in the preceding generation, you didn't choose an ancestor. And then in no other preceding generation, are you related, right? Um, so given that these are the different ways that you can be identical by descent or not, we can then measure that probability that you are IBD. And that is effectively what the F statistics do. So we can define that at F sub T, that is, what's the probability you're identical by descent in the present generation? That's equal to one on two N, that's this part here, plus the probability you are not identical by descent, one minus one on two n multiplied by the probability you were identical by descent in a preceding generation, which is this component here, right? Now, what we can then do is a little bit of algebraic magic, um, and we can actually simplify this down into a, a very simple recursion equation that will permit us to predict across many generations. So we do this by first, um, multiplying each side by negative one, that uh, permits us to do a little bit of rearranging, and then we add back in plus one, um, and this gives us this expression here, where one minus f sub t is equal to one minus f sub t minus one, so that's the preceding generation component, multiplied by one minus one over two m. What we can now do is proceed starting at t equals zero, and then go to t, so go to whatever generation into the future we want to go to, and all we need to do to be able to calculate that f value, uh, that probability of being identical by descent, is just raise the second term to t, right, so how many generations do we want to iterate from when we started to when we ended. And what's really important about this is that as t gets large, so the longer or the more generations you iterate over, that f sub t goes to 1. Okay, so that the, the probability that you are identical by descent as t gets large goes to 1. What that means is that everyone in the population is IBD. They are identical by descent. The longer, the, the more generations you iterate over, that probability becomes one, guaranteeing everyone will eventually be related to each other. And this occurs at a rate that is the reciprocal of the population size, one on two n. So again, the smaller the population, the faster it is that everybody shares a recent common ancestor. Big populations, it takes longer for everyone to share a, a single common ancestor, right? 
So that's, that's what genetic drift and, and using the sort of idea of inbreeding statistics for the, like uh, the F statistics tells us is that eventually everyone will be identical by descent. Um, and this leads us uh, very nicely into the next concept in genetic drift, and that is coalescence. So this idea about being identical by descent, we're kind of iterating forward in time, right? We're, we're thinking about, we're walking forward in time, at what point is everyone related? Coalescence looks at it the reverse way. So starting at the present day, and then walking backwards, how far do we have to go until everyone is related? So since we know the forward in time guarantees relationships, the backward in time does exactly the same. So let's see if we can link these two ideas together. So let's start off at generation zero um, and say there are 10 lineages um, and each lineage is just represented by colors, okay? Um, and then notice that by T equals 15, so going down this direction, there is only one lineage left and it is orange. Okay, so walking in that direction, what we would say is that forward in time, the orange lineage has been fixed. Everyone in the population is now identical by descent. All right. Backward in time, if we start off at the orange down here, and then we say, okay, at what point does everyone in the population have one and only one ancestor? Um, we can see that these lineages eventually coalesce into this one starred individual at time point two. Now this tells us a couple of really interesting things. First is that forward in time uh, models uh, keep account of all lineages, right? Every single lineage they keep account of from every single generation, despite the fact that the majority of all of those lineages will not contribute any genetic material to the modern day. Right. So uh, here we had a bunch of lineages, right, but only the orange one ends up being the ancestor of everyone alive. If you were looking forward in time, you're keeping up with all of them. Right. But if you are going backwards in time in the coalescent approach, you're only keeping up with lineages that actually contribute to the modern day. This makes a lot of the coalescent models a lot simpler and a lot more tractable than the forward in time models where you're having to keep up with individuals that are never actually going to leave offspring to the present day. It also shows us something else is that in a coalescent framework, right, the last common ancestor of the population is just one individual that existed in a population, right? So though we know that we started iterating at time point zero, you know, back here, this is actually the most recent common ancestor of the current population. This individual had an ancestor, right? Like this is their ancestor. And we also know that this is that this generation is not when this population emerged. So this tells us a couple of important points um, that we should always bear in mind is that coalescence is not origin of the population. So just because we say, that, you know, the coalescent ancestor, the most recent common ancestor lived at this point in time, that says exactly nothing about when the species emerged or when the population emerged. It only tells us when, at what point into the past is everyone identical by descent, right? That's it. That's all that it can possibly tell us. To get the origin of the population, the origin of the species, we have to compare to some other sister taxa, right? That will allow us to get you know, closer to that answer. But just a coalescent analysis in a single population will not get us that answer, okay? Um, and again, this, the starred individual is not the only individual alive. There are many other individuals alive. The population size has not changed, right? It's exactly the same population size through time. But as we've shown previously, the, the way genetic drift works is that it guarantees loss or fixation. So there will always be either the lineage will be lost or it will be the only lineage around. That's what genetic drift absolutely guarantees us. Okay, so another thing to bear in mind is that for each generation, the probability of coalescence is one on two n. Because remember, this is just genetic drift, right? So going backwards in time, we're saying, what's the probability that you came from exactly the same ancestor? Well, that means that you picked one out of two impossible ancestors. So that's the rate of coalescence backwards in time. Um, the average time that we should have to wait for two lineages to coalesce is then 
um, T lambda is equal to 4n divided by i, i minus 1, where i is the number of lineages that we're asking are going to coalesce. If there's only two lineages, right, that we're looking at, then the average time to coalescence for two lineages is 2n generations. As we add any number of lineages, right, as the number of lineages gets large, um, then the average time to fixation of all of those lineages uh, approaches 4n, which again brings us back to the previous slides where we were talking about the average time to fixation being 4n generations. Um, this also tells us something really important about the shape of coalescent trees, right? Um, and so what it shows us is that as we sample more and more individuals in the population, that is to say as I, which is the number of lineages we're sampling, gets really large, most coalescence is going to happen rapidly. It's going to happen rapidly and really early on. Um, and that's what's being shown here in this tree. So we start off with six lineages, and then by time uh, T of two up here, we only have two left. Right. And most of it, most of the lineages have been lost by by this line. So there most of them are, are truncated really early on. And then you get long lineages backwards in time. So on average, half of the waiting time for coalescence is in the last two lineages. Right. So remember, 2n is the average time for two lineages to coalesce. And so for any number of lineages, most of the time that you're waiting for the last coalescent event is in the last two lineages. Um, and again, just to really drive this point home, drift ensures population wide IBD will be reached. There will always be one ancestor to any population. Um, that is what genetic drift ensures. Okay, so sort of the last concept I want to touch on is the effective population size. This is a concept that is um, deeply misunderstood, not just in the general public, um, who maybe don't even consider this idea, but it's, it's misunderstood among a lot of biologists, like, if, if, like non-population geneticists, people that don't work with this idea a lot, um, really struggle to understand what it means and what it's actually measuring. Um, but it's a super important variable because just like with mutation, we had mu, mu was our value. For selection, we had s, right? So for drift, our, our sort of measure that's important is population size, right? Um, but some interesting things can happen in the dynamics of empirical systems that make the um, population size not a good reflection of the variance in allele frequencies. So let me let me give sort of a, a mock hypothetical empirical example. Okay, so imagine you were working on gorillas. Uh, you're, you're working on a population of gorillas, and you know because you've you know been studying them for many generations and you've counted up how many individuals there are. You know that the census population size of this population of gorillas is a thousand. Okay, and then you go out and you measure the frequency of some allele. Right, that you think is neutral, you think it's just, you know, neutrally changing in the population, and you measure the frequency of that allele as 0.6, okay, um, starting off, and then you measure it again over subsequent generations, right, so you, you measure it once, and then every single generation you measure it, and what you find is that the variance in that allele frequency every single generation is 0.0012, okay, now does that match what we expect to see, right? Is, is that the variance in the allele frequency that we expected to see? Well, we can calculate the expected variance in P, which is giving the, the variance equation that I showed you previously, and given that we know the census size, right? So if P started off at 0.6, and then we just plug in 0.6, divide by two times a thousand, that's the census size that we've empirically calculated, we see that actually the expected variance should be much lower in fact, it should be an order of magnitude lower than the variance that we actually observed. What's going on here? What explains this? Well, that means fundamentally that drift is occurring faster than what we expected given the census population size. And in fact, the rate is effectively that of a population of size 100. Hence, what the effective population size, which is often written as N sub E, uh, represents is the rate of drift in an idealized right fisher population, right? An idealized right fisher population is that transition matrix population that we calculated previously. 
Um, and you can rearrange the expected variance equation like so, where n sub e is equal to p1 minus p divided by two times the per generational variance in p. Okay. Now, this again, this is, it is it's important to understand what this value is actually telling us. One is that the value is real insofar as that it is actually capturing what the rate of genetic drift is. Right? And that's something that we that we want to know about, right? We want to understand how fast our allele is being fixed or lost in populations because that's telling us something important about the dynamics of that population. But it is fake, right? The effective population size is not real insofar as it doesn't actually reflect any number of individuals, right? It's, it's not like, okay, if the effective population size is 100, that means the census size is like wrong. Like, like, no, no, no. It's not telling you about the actual number of individuals in a population. It's only telling us about the rate of genetic drift. Um, so we can ask, well, what might cause this effective population size to be different from the census population size? And there are several things. And these are all things that are basically acting to increase stochasticity in populations. Um, one of them is breeding structure. So if we're studying gorillas, we know that gorillas have harems, right? Where one male basically guards a bunch of females and has sole access to them. If that's the case, then that means most of the males that you would be counting in the census size aren't actually getting to reproduce, right? So the number of genes being left to the next generation are far less than what you would expect given the count of the population itself. So that's how breeding structure can make genetic drift faster than what you would have expected. Another thing is if the population size has not been constant through time. So the population today is a thousand, but like, uh, you know, a generation ago was only a hundred, then you're, the amount of genetic variation that you have, and hence like the, the rate at which that variation is going to change generation to generation, is actually biased downward towards the lower end. And in fact, the effective population size can also be estimated as the harmonic mean of the census size over many generations. Uh, and the harmonic mean is always downwardly biased towards the lower values. Another thing that can that can make effective size different from the census size is population structure. So if you have um, lots of like little localized populations that are not freely interbreeding with each other, but are like exchanging migrants periodically, um, this actually acts to inflate the population wise effective size because drift is slower. And drift is slower because now for any allele to increase in frequency, you have to wait for a migrant to carry it to each and every subsequent little population, right? It has to increase in the population it's in and then be carried to another one, right? So that actually makes drift slower than what you would expect given the just the raw count of individuals. And then lastly, natural selection. So natural selection can make drift stronger by reducing the number of alleles present, right? So what it's actually doing is it's making everyone more related to each other, right? Because it's, it's driving an allele to fixation, right? And by doing that, it's basically increasing the rate at which people are, or which individuals are identical by descent and any loci that are in association with that one being selected will also increase faster. Now, if they're neutral, they're increasing by drift, right? They're, they're not increasing by selection. Selection is not acting on them. They're being dragged along, right? And that faster dragging along is reflected in the reduction of the effective size in that region of the genome, right? So these four things and then other things as well are some potential causes that could deviate the effective population size from the census population size. So again, just to reiterate, the effective population size is the fundamental quantity that is measuring the rate of genetic drift in an idealized right fisher population. Um, it is real insofar as it, it is measuring the rate of drift, but it is fake insofar as it's not actually a population size in the way that you might think about it. Okay, so that was a lot of information. In summary, genetic drift is the stochastic change of allele frequencies due to finite population sizes. Um, doesn't matter how big your population is, there is no infinite population. Every single population is finite, and so genetic drift is always acting. Um, the rate of drift is inversely proportional to the population size. 
which is one on two in. And we've seen that come up many times, right? Whether it's coalescence, whether it's probability of being identical by descent, um, whether it's the probability of fixation and of a brand new, you know, mutation, like that one on two in is a key parameter that comes up many, many, many times. Um, and furthermore, that the average time to fixation is four in. Um, further, drift can be approximated using the binomial distribution, and hence it has a variance equal to that binomial distribution variance. Um, we showed how we could how we could calculate it through that and gave some empirical examples. Um, the Wright Fisher model we introduced um, examines the probability of state transitions using a matrix algebra approach. Um, and then from this, we found that the probability of fixation is equal to the initial frequency in the population. Um, furthermore, that coalescence is just fixation backwards in time, right? So, you know, the probability that your IBD is a forward in time dynamic coalescence is just the reverse of that. It's just looking at it backwards in time. Um, and then finally, that the effective population size measures the rate of drift in an idealized Wright Fisher population. Um, so that, ladies and gentlemen, is genetic drift. Um, I know that, you know, these videos are often very dense, lots of mathematical details, and that stochastic mathematical details are often um, the hardest for people to kind of wrap their heads around. Um, but hopefully by taking you through the sort of simple Wright Fisher model, you can begin to understand where a lot of these fundamental ideas in population genetics as related to genetic drift come from. Um, thank you so much for being here. If you have any questions, drop them in the comments, um, and I will catch you all next time.